Dr. Allen, thank you so much for joining. And by the way, I'm not sure, should I be calling you Joe or Dr. Joseph Allen or what yeah, do you just prefer? call me Joe, just call me Joe, that's good. Great. Um, well, can you start just by giving people your background um, and in particular where you've been focused in the last two months and how that connects with the work you've done in your academic career? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm right, currently a professor at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. I started and direct the Healthy Buildings Program there. But I'd say higher order and more relevant to what's happening right now is my, my expertise is in the field of exposure and risk science. I work in the field of an, uh, occupational health and safety, so worker health and safety. I'm a certified industrial hygienist. Industrial hygiene is the field that anticipates, recognizes, assesses, and ultimately controls hazards. So I've been studying uh, you know, uh, healthy buildings for a long time, how to optimize indoor spaces for health. Um, but really more relevant to what's happening right now is that even before I was at Harvard, uh, I did forensic investigations of sick buildings for over a decade, and I still advise companies. And so um, uh, this, would, and this has involved uh, every type of radiological, chemical, biological hazard you could think of, infectious disease, outbreaks in buildings, so in hospitals even. And so while this pandemic is brand new to all of us, uh, a lot of it feels really familiar in terms of how do we take these kind of lessons and strategies in, in protecting worker health and safety and apply it to a novel virus, but still the, the frameworks hold and, and, our, and the approaches and strategies to mitigating risk um, play in. So I've been really active uh, helping uh, uh, media, financial, uh, commercial real estate companies, uh, even police departments, co the courthouses, everybody, everyone's trying to solve these same fundamental problems. How do we deal with our buildings in a way that allows us return to office safely? So, uh, and then looking forward, of course, I'm interested in, in healthy buildings beyond, you know, this immediate, uh, this immediate crisis. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the article I read was the, the op-ed that, that you wrote in the New York Times, which I think was, was striking both in, I think, you know, how, how important it made it feel. The air, the air we're breathing inside assets became so much more important, and it's so intuitive that, you know, employee health and employee well-being is so dependent on it. Um, but can you just walk through kind of the thesis of that article? Because the, the points are intuitive, but you had some really interesting data about how wide the, the gap can be between a healthy building and an unhealthy building. Yeah, you know, um, uh, this is, we've known for a long time that buildings can either aid in the spread of disease or act to protect us. And, um, you know, we saw early on in public health, we were tracking this in January. I first wrote about this at the end of January, and then we had this New York Times article come out saying, you know, if you look at the history of infectious diseases, measles in schools, the first SARS outbreak, the MERS coronavirus outbreak, you've seen examples where poorly performing buildings actually led to explosive outbreaks. That tells you also that a building that's performing, that's performing well can mitigate this risk. And so the, the, the article is really straightforward. And you're right, it gets down to the basics. And in a lot, a lot of ways, what we're seeing with this pandemic is that we're getting back to the basics of public health and just about everything, right? We're all washing our hands more, covering your cough, keeping distance from people. You know, it's the time for the basics. And the basics of buildings is this. You want to bring in more fresh outdoor air. It has many benefits for infectious disease risk mitigation, but also many other benefits like better cognitive function, reduced work or absenteeism. And then also you want to make sure any air you're recirculating in your building runs through a higher efficiency filter. Where this comes from, first, I think we can think about the science, right? We know we're exposed to this virus three different ways, large droplet, fomite or surface, and airborne. So then once we know that, we line up the control strategies in the buildings. And to me, it becomes really logical about how you attack this. So when you want to bring in more fresh out air and filter, that's to control the airborne route of exposure. And, and how, do, how do owners think about that? What's the cost driver? Meaning if it's hotter or colder outside than the ambient air inside, um, does that put a higher cost burden to recirculate more outdoor air? And like, how do owners think about that inflection point between, you know, if it's the same temperature indoors as outdoors, it's probably relatively easy to just, you know, circulate more outdoor air, but in kind of very Northern cities or kind of, you know, uh, equator based cities, it would seem like that's really hard and owners need to look at the, the cost benefit analysis there as well. 
Yeah, absolutely right. There's there's always this cost uh, benefit trade off, and I'll say. Um, you know, I'm sorry, this is not a book plug, but we had a book come out last month called Healthy Buildings, How Indoor Spaces Drive Performance and Productivity. I wrote it with Harvard Business School professor and colleague John McComber. And I mentioned that because this is what we talk about in this book. We bring together health science and business science to show that what we think are these costs in terms of making healthy buildings are actually de minimis. They are absolutely trivial relative to the benefits you get. And that's in a non-pandemic situation, right? that we show and we walk through pro formas in this book that show if you make these decisions, you reap benefits across the enterprise. In a COVID-19 pandemic world, we don't even need a pro forma to say there's a benefit to a healthier building, right? We all know what's happening right now and the cost of the economy and lives and livelihoods that um, are underperforming buildings are, 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 are really uh, a problem. And if you have a high performing healthy building, uh, that can protect people. And also, you know, as we decide about when we reopen this economy and governments can declare all they want, building owners can declare it all they want, the ultimate decider of when we reopen the economy is the consumer. And the consumer is going to go back to a healthy building, be it a healthy restaurant, a healthy school, a healthy um, commercial office. So, um, you know, deploying these healthy building strategies, you know, the cost benefit analysis really kind of disappears during a pandemic. And even in a non-pandemic, in a post-COVID world, the benefits far outweigh uh, the costs. And I'm curious, just on that point, it seems like what, what this crisis has done is it's provoked questions that I think weren't asked before. Uh, there's this acute focus on air quality, and this recognition that air quality is intrinsic to public health and our own personal health. But you know, if you were to look, say, last year, were if you were to look at the tenants that are asking questions of landlords, like how healthy is my air? What kind of filtration systems do you use? How much new outdoor air is, is used versus how much is recirculated? Were those questions on the rise? Um, and I'm curious to think, to consider like, how much do you think that'll change, right? So if you were to look at, you know, December, 2019 to December, 2020, um, how, how dramatic is the increase going to be in the demand from tenants for higher standards around air quality indoors? Yeah, um, you know, it's a fundamental shift. And here's how I, I see it and have seen it, right? It's healthy buildings have been a trend that have been on the rise. I think leading players were starting to tap into this. Um, but like many trends that were just starting, this pandemic has accelerated many. Think about telemedicine or work from home. And these are just exploded and they're here to stay. Even the, the, the relative decline in, in retail. So this uh, pandemic is accelerating these trends. All of a sudden, people who are on the periphery that I've been talking to around the country, around the world, on the healthy building space, have now inquired about this again in the past two months. So I think this is, this is here to stay. Um, and, and it reminds me of, um, honestly, the, the period in post 9-11 where you know, it ushered in really a 20-year phase uh, focused on security. And I think we're about to enter this extended period where it'll be a health first mindset. And in terms of where the driver is, right, there are definitely investment pressures here, but it's coming from the consumer. In our book, we talk about, uh, we say, you know, people are interviewing your building. And I bet that's surprising to a lot of people to think about that. But now with low cost sensors, people can come in and take some measurements of your place. And maybe more importantly, or to be aware of, is that people are reporting this. And right now, if you look on Glassdoor, for example, you know, you expect to find people reporting about, uh, you know, maybe their boss or their salary or their title. But there are also comments about your building. This place smells. It's too hot. I can't concentrate. The management doesn't care about air quality. I mean, these are real things that are out there. And if you look at what's happening right now, people are already posting about management and building response to COVID. The good and the bad. My management is taking this seriously. Here's everything they've done. I love it. Or... I can't believe they expect us to work in this. You know, I'm scared about my, my health and safety. So, you know, you have all these drivers and for the first time in history, everyone in the world is really acutely aware of how buildings influence our health. So this is why I'm really confident that, you know, what has been this slow ramp up in healthy buildings um, it has accelerated and, and it will, you know, is here to stay. And how do you think about just kind of broadly, if we're to just look at commercial real estate, the the ecosystem of actors and the number of constituents that go into you know, a tenant deciding to locate their office in a particular building. You have the landlord, you have the property manager, 
you have the tenant and landlord leasing agent, and then you have you know the CEO and the head of real estate for the company. And I think it's a safe assumption, as you said, to say to, to assume that the questions around air quality are all on the rise. But is there is there a standardized metric through which um, almost a comparative analysis can be done? So like I think back to we just lease space in Los Angeles, and I looked at you know all the different buildings that we were evaluating, but nowhere on that fact sheet was a standardized measure of air quality. And I didn't even think to ask that question. Now, I totally agree with you. Next year, right, when we release space, I will be asking that question, but what's the metric that really standardizes that comparison? Yeah, you know, right now, um, it's, it's the Wild West, and that's the problem, right? It's no fault of your own or anybody else's. It's kind of new for all of us, or, you know, we've been studying this, but it's new for the market to try and say, well, I want a healthy building. Now, what is a healthy building, right? Now everyone's asking that. So unlike green buildings, which have become standardized, it's still the market is still trying to figure out what a healthy building is. I think we know what it is. We've written about, we call the nine foundations of a healthy building based on 40 years of science or other people with other metrics, and that's okay. But I'll tell you what you can do, and, and we talk about this in the book, and again, I'm not trying to plug the book here, but uh, I think it's valuable for, for your uh, listeners here and your audience. We talk about health performance indicators. So all, everyone listening to this tracks KPIs or key performance indicators, and we like the idea of calling them HPIs or health performance indicators, thinking about what building attributes should you be tracking that tell you it's a healthy building. So exactly the things you should be asking for in your next lease to say, Hey, I thought about acoustics. What, are, what about the materials you put in here? Are they healthy in terms of the chemical content? Um, what about the air quality? What about the ventilation system? In addition, there are other metrics that are more leading, and we talk about taking the pulse of the building. So if you go to the doctor's office, first thing you do, right, take your pulse, blood pressure. And the only way to really know how a building is performing, because it changes over time, is to take the pulse with real time and sometimes you know, more traditional air, air quality uh, measures you can actually measure these, the performance of a building. So it becomes not just how did you feel in this space or what does a plaque on a wall say, but it says, no, I'm gonna take objective measures and I'm gonna look at the science to say, here's a risk-based measure that I have to meet. Here's normative or benchmark data. And by the way, I wanna hit optimal levels that I know are optimal for employee performance, well-being, and productivity. And, and then how do, you, how do you correlate that with the data from the employees themselves, right? So. I get that you can standardize the information intrinsically about a building and its air quality and its recirculation and filtration systems. But then how do you do the measurement to say, are my employees more productive? Are they getting sick less? Are they happier? Are they more content? Do they have better lighting? How is that tracked? Is that incumbent on tenants to track that internally? Yeah, I think it's challenging to do. I mean, you can do this through employee sentiment and, and this kind of stuff. You could track it, say, with uh, medical records or absenteeism, but it gets tricky. You're starting to get into you know, my field, which is you know, real epidemiology, and how do you control for all the potential confounding variables? And for many companies, they won't have enough data. It won't be large enough where they could see you know, a statistically significant difference. I think the better approach is this. You rely on the 40 years of, of deep, deep, deep scientific knowledge that shows when you make these improvements, it leads to a benefit. For these, example, these, yeah. these, these already correlative studies that just show this and they've shown already. it in a way. Yeah, I'll tell you one study we did, we called the COG effect study for cognitive function, where we put people in, a, in a, uh, an office environment and, and asked them to do their normal work routine. They were blinded to the test conditions. We tested their cognitive function at the end of the day. And all we did was change the air they were breathing without them knowing. So, and when we do this, we find that their cognitive function test scores improve across domains that you'll recognize instantly as relevant to productivity, crisis response, strategic thinking, information tracking and usage. And so these studies exist that say, hey, if you just make these minor tweaks or improvements to your building to make it a healthy building, we know it leads to cognitive function benefits. And it's not just our study, there's a whole rich body of evidence. Or take biophilic design, you have that nice plant behind you there, right? We've done these studies and we, we've published these three studies in the past year that show biophilic design leads to benefits in terms of creative thinking or uh, a, a quicker um, stress uh, re, uh, reaction where you recover quicker from a stressor. So it, going from this point where we, you know, we have all this hard data, we've quantified it, we've done the controlled studies. And so you know, do we have to test you and your 
place to know that you feel better because you have nice views and lighting and, and the plant. We don't even need to do it. We know there's a benefit. You know there's a benefit, right? So um, I would say you rely on this rich body of evidence rather than trying to create your own, say, within your tenant uh, organization. And I'm curious, and I don't want to get too far off topic, but this is just um, intellectual curiosity. If you were to kind of group knowledge workers together and you were to say there's a certain uh, set of health conditions related to air quality that, that clearly impact cognitive function and crisis response and everything that you mentioned, there are obviously, there's obviously a lot of variance in what we expect knowledge workers to do. The behaviors and the work uh, skills of a lawyer versus a creative director versus a designer versus a coder are all different. And when you think about the other attributes, like lighting, um, aesthetics, like the color aesthetics of the building, the, the kind of spatial layout, are there actual divergences in how you would, beyond just standardizing health, are there divergences in the kind of environment, the kind of ambiance you want someone working in that lead to better productive outcomes based on the industry or the particular skill set? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the science on that, you know, that specificity and it's it's almost like uh, you know getting to personalized health, but personalized indoor health. Right. I think we're moving there, and technology is allowing us to do that. Actually, so you know if you have a you're you're more productive at 73 degrees F, and I like 71 F, and we work near each other. Well, we're getting to a point where we can do that, right? Um, but the science isn't quite there yet to say you know let's say you're a creative director, you like a certain set of attributes. I will say this is really interesting though that. Um, what we're talking about here is basic human physiology. And while everyone has individual preferences and different susceptibilities and um, fundamentally any population we look across, we can see that there are these benefits to better buildings. So for example, we could test fifth graders in school on a math test and know that air quality influences them. We could test eighth graders in reading comprehension and know lighting influences them. We tested knowledge workers and air quality and higher order cognitive function. We see an impact. So, you know, you piece together enough of these studies, you start to realize that uh, um, regardless of the population, what work they're doing, if it's a lower order task, like a rote memorization or a higher order strategic thinking, we're seeing the effects of the building across all populations, uh, across all work types and across different aspects of cognitive function, be it, you know, uh, arithmetic versus creative thinking. So um, while I think we will get to a point you know, it's a nice uh, future roadmap for research to think about this personalized indoor health. I don't think we're at, we're not at the point yet where we can, you know, start uh, putting the demographic, demographic information together and, and really like tailor these recommendations based on, say, uh, the workforce in your building. Yeah, and it sounds like what you're saying is that at the basic level, we have to keep everyone healthy and we're not doing that today. And then you can kind of have those higher order levels of personalization and optimization and controls and automation that, that kind of give tenants and individual occupants the ability to control their environment to an even greater extent. Um, I'm curious, switching gears a little bit, um, one of the things I've talked to a lot of landlords about in the last, uh, I guess, three months, um, especially is the responsibility, the public health responsibility that has been thrust on them that I don't think anyone in the real estate industry truly internalized until this moment. And that touches on a lot of things, right? It touches on broad social issues like climate change and sustainability as well. But just focusing on public health, how do you think landlords need to reconceptualize their role in the world? Um, and I, I think about an example. I did a, a, a similar video interview, and someone mentioned that the responses of office park owners was far more thoughtful than the responses of individual asset owners because they conceptualize themselves as being responsible for a micro city. And it's kind of like an issue of, um, of culpability and responsibility. Meaning if I were to drink dirty water in Los Angeles and it got me sick, I know who to get mad at. I know who's responsible. It's the public officials. But if you're breathing unhealthy air, you're a little less clear on who's responsible. Is it the tenant? Is it the landlord? Is it the city that didn't shut down the building in time? How do you think this kind of cascading level of um, jurisdictions kind of looks like in a post-COVID world? Is there just higher levels of cooperation needed? And that's probably a very loaded, complicated question, but I'm just curious to get your thoughts on that. No, I, I like it because look, I'm, I'm a public health professor. I, I, I've been thinking a lot of 
about sustainable development goals, the ESG, and I fit, think this fits in the conversation. And here's what I've been talking about this for a while that, um, that really the, the, the person who manages your building has a greater impact on your health than your doctor. And when I say that to rooms of real estate professionals, you know, you see, it's, it's, a, it's a, a shift in how we think about your responsibility. You're really in the healthcare business. We spend 90% of our time indoors. We're an indoor species. The decisions you make about your building will determine my health. If I'm working there, living in your building. Um, and it sounds, you know, it's not an exaggeration. It, it really isn't. And then moving beyond that, right? But beyond what happens inside the building, if you think about the context of buildings and real estate in terms of what's happening globally and our next slow roll crisis, which is climate, that we will come out of COVID and need to, this will be right in our face. You know, 80% of global energy is fossil fuels combustion. Buildings consume 40% of that. Uh, we're, we're on a path towards 9 billion people on the planet. For the first time in history, more of us live in cities than do not. We're building a, a city, the, the equivalent um, of, uh, of Boston, where I am, you know, every couple of weeks for the next 30 years, just in India alone. And so you start to put the real estate context, not just what's happening in the building, into this global trends that are happening. And you recognize without exaggeration that the decisions we're making in terms of our buildings are, will determine our, our overall health and well-being. And I mean on a grand level, population level, for decades to come. So it is a responsibility that, uh, that we all have. And, and we saw the pressures before COVID that, you know, if you're not moving in this direction because you have a moral responsibility to do it, the market's gonna force you to do it anyway. You've seen all the shifts and conversations uh, around ESG, what is being demanded from investors, but also from consumers and the bottom up push. So if you're not already not moving in that direction, you know, we're, we're gonna come out of COVID-19 and be right back in that space where people are gonna demand better from all of our industries and all of our sectors to say, something's not quite right in how we're operating here. And we have a larger responsibility towards people's health, both the time they're in our building, but also, we talk about the health beyond the four walls of the building. Yeah, and, and the interconnectedness of that building in larger social systemic crises that we're facing. And I like the way you put it, it's a, it's a different time horizon, right? So the, the, the response to COVID is, it's a very, we, we need to respond in a very accelerated uh, fashion where there's expediency. And the climate crisis feels longer dated. Um, and we can talk about why people feel that way and elements of social responsibility that are generational. But I think everyone increasingly understands that real estate's responsibility in the climate crisis has been completely overlooked. Um, for, and it has been for a while because the consumptive power of buildings is just enormous. Um, the stat you just mentioned, right, that 40% of fossil fuels are consumed by buildings is shocking, right? The fact that that's larger than industries that we typically associate with um, being the culprits, so to speak, in the climate crisis, heavy industry, heavy manufacturing, transportation, shipping, logistics, real estate is actually the clearest and the most obvious one. And one of the things that's so fascinating I found about your research is that you've connected sustainability, not just to the dollars and cents of, yeah, of course, building owners want to spend less on energy. But you've actually connected it to employee well-being, I think, in a really interesting way. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, we, yeah, and I agree with everything you said here. And, um, and this is where, you know, I think some of the tools we're developing would be really helpful to the real estate community in that we're taking these energy efficiency measures, right? We care about climate. It also helps your business. That's great. And what we've been able to do is uh, with a tool we call COBE for co-benefits of the built environment is to take this energy savings and has three outputs of our model. The first is how much money did you save? That's great, that's your bottom line benefit. The second one is how much emissions were averted? Also uh, air pollutants, which have immediate health. Oh, wait, sorry, just, the third just, output. Let's get you up because we lost connection for about 10 seconds. Can you, okay, you want me to start over? over there? Sorry about that. Oh, yes. Okay, yes, sure. Sorry. So we have this tool we call COBE, Co-Benefits of the Built Environment, which lets you quantify three outputs, and it gets you back to a public health metric really fast, your sustainability efforts. So you save energy, you save money. That's We've all known that for a long time. That's easy to calculate. The model gives you that. Second, the model lets you say how much emissions were averted, both greenhouse gases 
and criteria air pollutants. Greenhouse gases have a longer term health effect. Criteria air pollutants have an immediate health effect. The last the third, uh, the third output is where it gets really interesting because we take all of this and we say, well, if we reduce the amount of air pollutants, we know what that means or translates to in terms of a health benefit. And we can calculate how your energy savings led to uh, averted premature deaths, averted missed school days, averted missed work days, reduced asthma attacks. And then you can monetize that again. So you can go for every dollar I saved in energy, what was my health and climate co-benefit footprint? For example, in the US, for every dollar saved in energy, we estimated that the green building movement saved another 70 cents in previously unaccounted for health and climate co-benefits. In a place like India, for every dollar saved, it's $12 in health and climate co-benefits. We've now taken this tool, COBE, and now you can apply it to portfolios or even individual buildings. And it gets you to a nice place of talking about energy in a different way. It's not just, just carbon, but it puts it into a metric. You know, I can't interpret carbon immediately. If you tell me 10,000 kilotons of carbon, I'm not, you know, what does that mean? Very few people can do that. But if you tell me that was fewer missed school days, I get that. Or that led to fewer deaths, everybody gets that. And so really, it's a really powerful tool to take energy and turn it back into a public health metric. It, it, it's interesting also because it connects so much with how certain countries and how certain states have responded to COVID, where we're in this kind of dilemma where we're trying to weigh the fiscal and macroeconomic consequences of shutting down an economy with the more personal uh, and public health and emotional um, consequences of this crisis. And you know, we can probably have different views as to um, how different states have responded, but I think it, it's clear that no one knows the, the, the right way to measure those things. And what's so interesting about that is making it concrete, making um, removing kilotons of carbon from the environment, making that concrete in terms of fewer missed school days, fewer hospital visits, fewer early deaths is, is so powerful. And you know, one of the things we've looked at um, at, at Fifth Wall is how governments have, in the US in particular, have changed their posture on sustainability and how that varies by state and by city. So as I'm sure you know, you know Trump pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord. Um, but in the last year, we've seen these really uh, inspiring, uh, confidence-building moves by cities, um, which is so profound. So New York enacted a carbon neutrality law. Los Angeles has done the same. And the powerful thing about real estate is that you can't move a building, right? Um, unlike most industries, you can move it around to where the regulations favor you more. You can't do that with a building. How do you see that um, being a tailwind for um, what you're talking about, right? Like connecting sustainability to social goods. Do you think governments should be looking at that and looking to report on that to their electoral bases? Yeah, I think, I, think you're, I think it's a really smart set of comments there because you're exactly right. I mean, our goal is to say, even with this tool, is to say, look, we would just want to give people the tools to make informed decisions, quantifiable, empirical decisions, right? And you might have a different value set than me and somebody else, but if we are just based on the same set of facts and say, this is the full accounting of that decision, then it might influence what decisions we all make. So, um, you know, I do think that's going to translate into certainly uh, the role for government to play. And particularly, you see cities and states taking a lead here in terms of climate. Um, but also organizations are, are, are leading on this as well. So I don't think it's an either or, you know, we have to wait for either government regulation or, or the uh, industry to do it. But I do like, I'll tie it back to this Kobe tool, this what's happening in New York and California. So Cal New York has local law 97. It's an aggressive energy reduction strategy for buildings. What we did is we applied this Kobe tool to say, you know, the energy reductions are great, but here's what the health benefits will be, which wasn't actually part of it. Even better, the next version of the tool we're working on will say, as a building owner or portfolio owner, you're trying to decide, well, what investment should I make? You know, what do I do? Do I fix, change out the light bulbs? Do I fix my mechanical system? And they're not all equal, these decisions. So this tool, we hope, helps provide a pathway where people can make better decisions. And then we apply it more broadly and say, well, if New York did this, what if Chicago did this? Mm -hmm. And we can kind of use the evidence to pull people along. And we're doing the same thing in California with their efforts on solar, uh, the law around solar and homes. We estimate the health and climate benefits. And then we ask more broadly, well, 
What if other states followed this? What would be the health and climate co-benefits as a way to uh, hopefully influence the conversation that's happening uh, both within organizations and within governments? Yeah, and you know, one of the things we looked at is to the extent the the fines in New York with the uh, local, um, I always forget the name of it. So 97, yeah, yeah. 97, that's it. All right, so I'll start over. Um, one of the things we've looked at is with local law 97 in New York, what the estimated fines would be for landlords. And they're in the tens of billions of dollars. And so what I think is interesting about what you're, you're saying is that the economic consequence to landlords is obvious. There's a lot more fines that are going to be paid that weren't being paid, you know, five years ago. And that feels bad, right? People don't like punishing people unnecessarily. But what's so interesting is if you can say the, the costs of continuing to do what we're doing right now, it's not free. And those costs just show up in different places. They show up in, you know, graduation rates, they show up in hospital visits, they show up in, you know, missed work and school days. And actually quantifying that shows that cost benefit analysis in a, in a complete, almost more socially conscious way than I think today the issue is being framed between Republicans and Democrats, right? It's like, why would we want to pay fines or why would we support green energy? Um, because we know it's more expensive. But th the whole challenge has been, how do you attribute social costs to not doing something? And it sounds like this is a, this is an approach to doing that, which is fascinating. Yeah, you know, yeah, it, you're exactly right. And it, it's a bit more of an, um, I wouldn't say an honest accounting, but it's a full accounting. Yeah. Whereas before we say, we'll save energy. Well, why am I paying that fine? It's just, it's just energy or carbon. You know, it's an amorphous metric that people can't put their finger on. But if you say, well, this actually um, gets to health and, and kids' health, and it just changes that whole conversation. Because ultimately, right, that's what, that's what we care about for sustainability, right? Sustainability is ultimately about human health. It's not about carbon per se. We're talking about human health uh, and ability to thrive uh, in this world together. So yeah, it's just a, it's a way to have um, a more informed decision making process. And even for the people who have these larger portfolios to say, well, what are the, you know, if, if I do a, uh, an intervention in my building that maybe I think is good, and we don't actually know if it leads to better benefits versus something else, right? Uh, offsets in terms of energy use, time of day, all of these decisions that can be made in terms of your energy portfolio. But now there's a way to actually add the health quantification or quantify that health impact again. So again, it's, a, it's really a decision-making tool is how we see it. And I'm curious, just this is my last question, because it's, we talked to so many real estate owners that I'm sure they're going to listen to this and say, oh, okay, what do I do now? Um, what I've found is that in in Fifth Wall's investor base, the, the CEOs of the largest real estate owner operator developers, um, they do have a sense of altruism and they are increasingly internalizing their responsibility in public health issues and the climate crisis and big kind of um, societal themes and trends and currents that everyone is talking about. They're recognizing and they're internalizing um, that responsibility. But what they don't know is what to do. Uh, like if I believe everything you said and if I want to do it, what should I do with my real estate company to effectuate change? Yeah, I love that because uh, I think of what my brother says all the time to me. He says, you know, if we just uh, raise problems, that's called complaining. So if you raise a problem, you better have a solution uh, that you're going to yeah. propose to. So there's a way forward here, right? I think about um, even in buildings and in the book, we have a whole chapter dedicated to the nine foundations of a healthy building where we describe the science, but then say, not just here's the science and here's a problem, Problem says, well, here's what you should do. Right. Uh, same thing with healthy materials. We describe the problem and why we care about chemicals of concern and materials. And then we say, well, here's the strategy we think. We also talk about healthy building certification systems and say, there's some good, the bad, but here are 10 things that every certification system should have and the market should be looking for. Same thing with beyond the four walls and sustainability. So really it's solutions focused because the reality is we have plenty of science and knowledge. We know enough to act, right? We don't have to wait for the next study or the next crisis to hit us in the face to say, oh, we should do something different. Clearly all the signals say we need to change how we're doing things. They're actually uh, science-based interventions we can take today. Uh, and the beautiful thing about this is that there are wins to be had when that happens, right? Um, you know, you get a building that's, that performs better in energy, you, you get uh, the, the owner and tenant win. 
uh, if you have a building that performs better on healthy building strategies, your employees win, you win because they perform better. You're doing better on sustainability metrics, you're helping the planet, but this is also what every investor community is looking for right now too. And so there really shouldn't be a barrier to adoption because it's not like um, there's, they're not wins to be had. There are bottom line benefits to the business to be had uh, and the costs are downright trivial compared to the benefits across the board. So I like that, um, you know, it, it's, if we present it where everybody is a win, 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 everybody can win in this scenario, um, there really shouldn't be a barrier to us moving forward with a, a healthy buildings, where a future really where healthy buildings are the norm, not the exception, which is our current state. Yeah, uh, so I think it's so important to drive action right now in the real estate community because you have this window of time where everyone's focused on broad social problems and real estate owners are internalizing responsibilities they, they never had to before. So it is the time to affect change. So th thank you so much for, for joining. This has been uh, just so interesting. And I think it's gonna be so applicable, honestly, to, to real estate owners. Um, how can people learn more um, about your work and, and your writing? Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, I'm not uh, trying to sell a book here, but the help, I think you, if you liked what we're talking about here, uh, we describe a lot of this, including global mega trends, nine foundations of a healthy building, sustainability, future forward, what's coming next in that book, Healthy Buildings. Uh, and it's written with a Harvard Business School professor. So, um, you know, he knows he's really great. So um, that might be helpful to you. My Harvard Healthy Buildings program is at forhealth.org, F-O-R Health, where you can get down into the research if you want. But we also have high level, you know, op-eds and news stories that give you a sense and let you keep the pulse of what's happening in the healthy building world. We have uh, reports like the nine foundations of a healthy building you can download. It's meant to be accessible, two page executive summary. Uh, and I've written a couple of Harvard Business Review articles about this topic. Stale yeah. office air is making us less productive. Um, that really gives you, you know, in two or three pages, gives you a whole sense real quickly of the value proposition of uh, healthy buildings. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. And uh, I appreciate everything. So thank you, Dr. Allen. Yeah, thanks. Enjoyed the conversation. It was great.